It's going to be very interesting. We're going to talk a lot about your new book, of course, but just going back, how early did you find an interest in finance? Can you remember sort of the age or was it by coincidence? I can remember, well, I can't remember the exact date, but there was one very specific day when it happened. And the dirty secret of a lot of financial journalists, at least my generation, is that we never cared about finance. We never did. Uh, you know, I grew up, I'm a you know, child of the 80s and 90s. Uh, I wanted to be a war correspondent, foreign correspondent. And I studied international relations. I studied history. I studied political Islam, a bit of international law. Um, and I was actually going to be a, a journalist in the Norwegian army because uh, we have conscription in Norway, as you know. And I thought that sounded a little bit more interesting. But I wasn't sure about journalism. But I did have a part time job whilst doing my master's at the LSE at The Guardian, where essentially I did what is called sub editing, but it's the lowest form of sub editing. I was just making sure picture captions were correct and things like that. But I was doing night shifts and The Guardian has a very good media section where lots of media jobs were, were posted. And idly one night I was reading through it. I saw there was a posting for a financial journalist in Dubai and I had actually no interest in financial journalism. We had had one city editor from one of the big English papers come to my journalism school to give a talk. And his sales pitch was essentially, you get to have really long boozy lunches, which, you know, who doesn't like long boozy lunches? But it's not what young idealistic journalist students want to hear, right? We want to change the world. We want to be war correspondents. Uh, but I didn't know anything about finance, but I wasn't sure about going back to Norway. And I thought it could be interesting. I always like doing new things. I like challenges. I like learning stuff. And Dubai is the least Middle Eastern part of the Middle East, but I knew I wanted to go there. So I thought, screw it, I'll apply. And I was still very skeptical until I flew in. Yeah, absolutely awful salary. Put to work like a hamster immediately. But my very first day, I interviewed a local sheikh about Islamic reinsurance. Technically, it's called retakaful. Uh, because Islamic insurance is called takaful. And it is as wildly exotic as it sounds. But I just loved it. I just thought it was fascinating. Here I was, this guy who knew absolutely nothing, interviewing some local sheikh, sitting there in his thobe, talking about Islamic reinsurance and learning about like what the like what the you know Sharia says about financial principles and how you can reinterpret this in modern context and how this works in practice. And I was just hooked. So that's how I ended up in financial journalism, um, entirely by chance. And I did get to be a war correspondent for a brief period a little bit later, but uh, the first cut was the deepest. I mean, that's super interesting because uh, I was about to ask you about the question how you ended up in, in Dubai, but the question was also linked to the lessons learned between, I don't know, uh, skill versus luck, because you had like a great take on that as well. Yes. Um... Look, I mean, it's popular to say that you, you make your own look and you can do that to a certain extent. But look, if I look at my own career with, you know, objective eyes, I've had lots of lucky breaks. Now, if, if I'd been useless at my job or utterly lazy, then I probably wouldn't be where I am now. There are, you know, there are a lot of really good journalists who are unemployed these days. This is a tough industry that's been basically in decline for several decades. So I do think I am proud that you know, I am where I am, but I'd be lying if I said I hadn't had many lucky breaks, like that job in Dubai. That was just pure chance that I was lazy, basically, I'm not quite lazy, but bored one night at The Guardian and was looking at the job ads. Uh, that job was not a great job, but actually was a great training ground because I just had to work my socks off. So I had to learn a lot about finance very early on. And other people have like a slower learning curve. Mine was steeper and it was intense, but that was quite good. And then I just happened to apply for a job at Bloomberg News because frankly, they just needed anybody who was not an idiot and who spoke, spoke fluent Norwegian and English. So then I got a job covering Nordic economics for Bloomberg. Again, purely because I was the right person at the right time. And then I applied for a job at the FT back in the Middle East. That's how I ended up here. And again, pure luck. I mean, essentially, I saw the FT was launching a Middle East edition. I wrote a cold email to the Middle East editor, Rula Khalaf, and misspelled her name in the email. She has not yet discovered that. Um, 
and said, look, hey, if you ever need anybody, um, yeah, I'd be really interested. I'd love the FT. You know, being a Middle East correspondent would be a huge dream. And she answered. And what I later learned as well is that Rula, and I love it a bit, she's just one of the best people I've ever worked with. She is now the editor-in-chief of the FT. But she's not great with email. And she'd had lots of applications from, frankly, more qualified candidates, people who spoke fluent Arabic, which I certainly didn't. But she just happened to be sitting in front of her email that day when I emailed. So she saw my CV. She thought, well, this guy looks fine and he'll probably be cheap. Let's just get him in. So then two weeks later, I was in back in Abu Dhabi in Dubai. So again, it was luck. Um, and I think a lot of people forget that side of things because it's always easy to think of any success as your own triumph and every failure is somebody else's fault. And quite often there, there's serendipity or bad luck involved in both.